This tiny little laptop is so freaking cute, it makes me want to just pinch its little cheeks and build it a tiny laptop doghouse and decorate it with fairy lights and put the tiny laptop inside with squishy pillows and stuffies and a little food bowl full of Skittles and tell it how cute it is 47 times a day, every day, for the rest of my life. But instead of doing that, today I'm going to review it and play some games on it. I'll do the laptop doghouse thing in the, in the next video. Hey there, how's it going? I'm TechTweed, welcome. Thanks for clicking on the video today. I've always loved the idea of tiny little laptops because, I mean, how couldn't you? The fact that you can put an entire computer into something so small and somehow still have a usable computer that works just the same as a big thing is just so pleasing to the minimalist that I fantasize I could be. And yes, I realize the irony in me saying that I want to be a minimalist, considering, yeah. But I'm not lying. Part of me is drawn to the minimalist lifestyle. And I think that's what's so appealing to me about this. The GPD Pocket 4. It's a little laptop, which is super neat and interesting on its own, but it's also fully decked out. It has a ton of IO and expandability. You can do normal computer stuff on it. It's a beast for gaming. You can use it for content creation. You can use it as a portable workstation for like industrial applications. It's sort of a Swiss army knife because it can do so much and it takes up no more space than it needs to. It even has the word pocket in the product name. So that means that it fits in your pocket. That's, that's what it means right? There, there's a lot to talk about with this thing, and we're going to do that. But first, I need to mention that this GPD Pocket 4 was kindly provided to me to review by WhatGeek. They're a good store, and they have good prices, especially if you use the discount code TECH12. That saves you 12%, and it actually works site-wide. I'll have a link to their store in the thingy below. The specs of this bad boy are pretty freaking amazing. We're rocking the Ryzen AI9 HX370 chip. For memory, you get either 32GB or 64GB of DDD-DR5X RAM clocked at 7500 mega things per second, and we get 2 terabytes of storage by way of a 2280 NVMe SSD. The screen is LCD 8.8 inches with a resolution of 2560 by 1600 and a 144Hz refresh rate. And we also get Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.3, a 45 watt hour battery, and it's running Windows 11 Home. The screen flips up, obviously, but it also flips around. We have a trackpad up top, and that supports touch gestures like tap to click, right click, and scroll. And we also get some physical mouse buttons over here. We get a very uh, interestingly laid out condensed keyboard with all the important keyboard keys and functions, and it's backlit. For I.O., on the left side, we get a full-size HDMI hole and a USB 3.2 Gen 2 hole and a speaker, power button on the front. On the right, we have a headphone hole and another USB A hole and another speaker. Around back, we have a 2500 megabit per second ethernet hole and some vent holes for airflow and a USB C 3.2 Gen 2 hole and a USB C 4.0 hole. And this here is an expansion module, which we'll talk about right right now actually so what geek sells this as a bundle the device comes with this module which is a micro sd card reader however they also sent me this module here the kvm module it's super easy to install you just gotta take out these two screws and yank out the old one and shove in the new one and screw it in nothing to it really there's a few different expansion modules you can get a 4g lte module to use a sim card and have always online you can also get a eia rs232 module which is a serial port for connecting to like data terminal equipment or machines or whatever i opted for the kvm which lets you use the laptop's inputs like the trackpad or mouse or keyboard as the inputs for anything you plug into this usb c hole and this hdmi hole is HDMI in so you can use this laptop as the input and monitor for your other devices like a mini PC or whatever you can also record video through HDMI here which got me very excited because I do that this is like the ultimate portable content creation machine because you can capture video and edit video you have more than enough power and RAM and storage on here to do video editing I'm really looking forward to using this as a minimalist workstation like a cool guy rather than lugging around a bag full of equipment like a chump. And speaking of portability, that's the main draw to this thing. It's tiny, right? I joked about it being pocketable earlier, but I don't think it's, uh, actually, maybe we should test it out. Yo, dweeb! Yeah? 
I need a pocket test. Wait, what? This? Yup. It's not gonna fit. I don't care. Do the test. But, but I can't. It doesn't, dude. Don't complain. Just do it. But I, I can't though. Dweeb! What? Put it in your pocket! You're not listening! I can't- Yeah, so it's not pocketable, apparently. But it is nice and small. This would be super easy to toss in a bag or a backpack. It's around 780 grams, which is a heck of a lot lighter than the 1200 gram laptop that I used before. However, it should be obvious, but sacrifices had to be made to get it this small and light. The main sacrifice is the keyboard. You definitely need to develop some new muscle memory for typing on this thing. I'm not there yet, but I don't doubt that I'll get there if I use this thing a lot more. I am a huge fan of this screen. 144 hertz refresh rate. That feels so silky smooth, not just for gaming, but even just for like Windows tasks. I also love that this screen flips around and you can do tablet mode and still access all the IO. Also, you can use it in tablet mode without the keyboard under your fingers around the back. This feels like a proper tablet PC because of the way that it did the screen swivel. And it's even loud enough to watch Tetweed videos loudly in a crowded restaurant. So you're covered there. That wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. We're on Windows 11 here, and ordinarily this is where I'd complain about Windows 11, but I mean, this isn't a handheld, it's a laptop, so considering you'll want to do laptop stuff like use full Windows apps and browse the web and do file management and run productivity software or whatever else you'd be doing with a laptop, having Windows is a good thing in this case. And the only proprietary software that they have on here is uh, this program. It's called Motion Assistant, and it's not very impressive looking, but it gets the job done. You can control the TDP and the fan and do extra stuff like performance overlays and tweak any aspect of the hardware. This software is the same stuff you usually get on GPD products, and it's not going to wow you with a flashy interface, but once you get used to it, you'll be glad it's here. A few quick benchmarks before we get into the games, why not? With Cinebench R23, we got a multi-core score of 17,165 and a single core score of 2,021. In 3D Mark Time Spy, we got an overall score of 37. 42 and in crystal disc mark i got these results whatever whatever those mean and when it comes to gaming we're using a ryzen hx 370 chip and you're going to get about the same performance on here as you'll get with any device that uses this chip we have the ability to go up to 30 watts on the processor but that's really not going to be necessary i made a video recently that was a deep dive into the performance of this chipset and my big takeaway is that you very quickly get into diminishing returns once you go past 18 watts and that's what i'm going to be using today because uh really i'm never going to go above that even when i'm plugged in, the difference in heat and fan noise isn't worth the minor FPS bump you get past 18 watts. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, I'm running at 2560 by 1600 with 50% resolution scale and the high settings, and 18 watt TDP of course. And I was getting a pretty good frame rate like this around 49 fps on average obviously we could squeeze out more performance if we bump down the game settings to medium or low or ran at a lower native resolution but I'm, I'm very happy with this some people might consider 800p too low for a laptop but since this isn't a big laptop it's a tiny little guy even 800p looks really good on a screen like this also this game has that amd cas sharpening so that kind of helps compensate shadow of the tomb raider isn't the most modern or demanding game but it's a game I always test, so I had to test it here. But now it's time to play something newer. It's time for some... Doom. The Dark Ages. This game is just... Uh... I, I am not impressed with the optimization in this game. It barely looks any better than Doom Eternal and it runs like four times worse. Doom Eternal was so well optimized, it ran on anything and now with the Dark Ages you need the, the best hardware to get it running and it doesn't even look that great. In some ways I prefer the graphic engine of Doom Eternal better than this but I digest. We're running at 2560 by 1600 with the lowest graphical settings and ultra performance FSR and we barely managed an average of 32 FPS and a good amount of stutters too. However, giving credit where credit is due, I didn't have to use FrameJet. 
and this is actually playable. I'd rather have a higher FPS, obviously, but I, I played this game on this machine and I enjoyed myself. So uh, yeah, I guess it gets the job done. Interestingly, I was actually getting worse FPS in the menus. <laughs> I think this alone shows that this game has some uh, optimization work that needs to be done. Just for a change of pace, let's check out this game, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. I've never shown this one off on my channel. I, I bought it for some reason. Intending to play, I guess, but it's just sad in my library. I'd like to play more. It looks good, but like, who has time for all these games? People who don't spend every waking hour making YouTube videos, I guess. This is running at 1600p with ultra performance FSR in the lowest possible settings. I wasn't really sure how we do here. I had no expectations, but even still, I was disappointed. It started off that terrible, like around 20 something FPS and very stuttery. And it didn't seem like there was anything I could do in the settings to get it running better. I couldn't turn frame gen on. However, on a whim, I switched over to Intel XESS scaling instead of FSR, and that actually helped. The average frame rate was about the same, but the frame pacing was a lot smoother. So it felt like more playable. I don't know if I'd actually be able to play like this. I imagine the game gets a lot more demanding when you get into like, you know, action scenes with more NPCs and explosions or whatever. I, I don't think I'm going to be giving this a pass here. And also like, dang, what happened to low settings in games? Like look at the detail in this foliage. How is this low settings? No wonder games run like dog water these days. Next up, I wanted to try an esports game, so this is Marvel Rivals. I don't know what I'm doing in this game. I can barely make sense of the main menu, so I'm just running the benchmark here. And I used their auto-optimize tool, which basically set everything at the lowest, 1600p with ultra performance FSR, lowest settings, and we got an average of 48 FPS. I, I know with esports games, you want super high FPS, so maybe this won't be playable for you, but this looked like the kind of performance that I'd be willing to live with if this was a game that I wanted to play. It's not. I don't care about uh, esports games or Marvel superheroes or anything. It's just not my thing. But I know this game is super popular and it kind of represents the performance of esports games, so I wanted to give you an idea of what to expect. I'm not, not going to test a million games here, so let's just finish off with some good old Witcher 3. This is 1600p with performance FSR, medium settings, and we ended up getting around 61 FPS on average. <laughs> this is just great. This game is actually pretty demanding if you crank up the settings, but it runs great on modest hardware, even considering this is the DX12 version the enhanced version. You can turn up the settings to make almost any PC buckle under the pressure, but keeping the settings modest gets you a really enjoyable FPS. It's also one of my favorite games ever, so I, I always enjoy seeing how it runs. I think this is a good demonstration of what this PC is good for. It's not nearly as powerful as your average desktop gaming PC or even a gaming laptop with a dedicated GPU, but considering the size of this little guy, being able to play games like Witcher 3 and get 60 FPS and not break a sweat, this is super cool. This thing goes for $1,300 on the What Geek website if you use that code that they gave me. That's, that's not cheap, but I mean, this is a laptop. We're not dealing with a handheld for retro games or anything. This is a full-on computer, and this is not a cheap chip. Just look around. Any, any device with this chip is typically around what this thing costs. But if you have a use case for a top-of-the-line little PC that does a ton of stuff, with professional use cases out the wazoo, you know who you are. And I think the size and form factor will be what determines if this is a right fit for you. And if not, then you shouldn't get it. Get something else. I don't care what you do. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm a, I'm a tech dweeb. Anyways, that'll do it for me for today. I'm tech dweeb. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.